I'm Catherine Oates. I'm a professor of anthropology here at the University of Alabama. This is my 29th year. My area is medical anthropology or the anthropology of health from a biocultural perspective and that is trying to meld the, the biological and physiological with the social and cultural determinants of health. And uh, I've known Kaylee Mean for several years now. She's one of the uh, outstanding anthropology majors in our department and I have the good fortune to advise her and to have had her in classes. And she has taken quite an interest to uh, uh, the issue of health and diet. And she's learned through readings in my class, for example, some of the classic readings by Mark Nathan Cohen and George R. Melagos, but uh, reading on her own as well, that she has learned that early humans actually had better health than we do now. And that kind of goes against the common belief about early people uh, being sick and dying young. And a lot of this has to do with diet. And so I think that uh, she'll, she'll be an excellent person to explain this more fully uh, to you. The, the idea of how our diet has lost its diversity and lost its uh, nutritional value over time and what that has done to us in terms of human health. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kaylee Meehan, and tonight I'm going to tell you about my revolutionary idea. I believe that hunter-gatherers are happier and healthier than we are. I'm going to start by telling you guys about some core concepts in anthropology that we use to study other societies. I'm also going to tell you about some characteristics and misconceptions we have about hunter-gatherers, and then we're going to talk about ways in which you can incorporate some of their life ways into our own. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an anthropology major, and I specifically study medical anthropology. My research is on childbirth, and it stems from my interest in evolutionary medicine. Uh, childbirth is one of the most innate things that we do. It ensures that the survival of our species. And I believe that the ways that we've been giving birth over two million years of hominid evolution should inform and teach us more about the ways that we give birth now. I'm also from Richmond, Virginia, but I'm originally from Cambridge, England. So I'm from this mixed British and American family. And that's really shaped my experience as a person. I'm also really passionate about organic gardening, and I'm an avid attendee of a local Tuscaloosa farmer's market. So let me tell you about some core concepts in anthropology, the first of which is cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is where we understand a society through the lens of their values. So we try to take away our own bias and look at a culture, such as the Trobrian Islanders here, by their values and through the lens with which they see the world. So keep that in mind as we talk about hunter-gatherers and try to see the world as they would. The next thing I want to talk to you about is presentism. And this is something we should watch out for in this case because this is where we apply the standards of today's technology and knowledge onto another society or another era. And the last thing is that hunter-gatherers are incredibly diverse. They span the poles of the earth all the way to the tropics, literally from the bottom of the earth to the top. And so we're going to talk about some general concepts that hold up across hunter-gatherer societies, but keep in mind that this is a really diverse group. So who are hunter-gatherers? Well, humans have been foraging for food for 95% of human history. This leaves the last 10 to 12,000 years of human existence that we have had agriculture. So we've been foraging for food before we had agriculture, and it was such a big change in the way that humans live that it is literally called the Neolithic Revolution. But we want to be aware of thinking of this as pre-agriculture necessarily, because that's, again, applying that idea of presentism. There are many hunter-gatherer groups that are contemporary with us, and they come in contact with agriculturalists, but choose to hold on to their life way. Another important thing is that hunter-gatherers are non-sedentary. So they're moving across the landscape, searching for food or following a herd. And this is in stark contrast to the way in which we live. We settle in city centers, and we have incredibly sedentary lifestyles compared to hunter-gatherers. Additionally, hunter-gatherers have a lot of leisure time. 
They only work for about two to four hours a day collecting food, and they might have some chores on top of that. So compare that to our lifestyle, working eight hours a day from nine to five, and then going home and having our own household chores. So they've got a remarkably lower amount, or a smaller workload than we do. And lastly, and most importantly, they have a comparable life expectancy to us. We seem to think that hunter-gatherers are cavemen who lived short, tragic lives ending at the hands of a saber-toothed tiger or a lion. But this is just not the case. Hunter-gatherers actually live by some estimates 68 to 78 years. And compare this to the U.S. life expectancy of 80 years for women and 84 years for women. And we see that for most of the Earth that does not benefit from a Western life expectancy rate, we see that most people on Earth are living right in that same ballpark as hunter-gatherers. So I want to pose this question to you. Why is it that hunter-gatherers live as long as we do without the technology we have? We have modern medicine, we have agriculture, and we should be able to feed everyone on this planet. And we have advanced computing technologies. So why are they living as long, and why are they so happy and healthy? And what elements of their lifestyle can we incorporate into our own? The first topic I want to talk to you about is social support. Hunter gatherers have remarkably consistent social support compared to us. A lot of us have lived in multiple states. We leave the place that we grew up in and go to college somewhere else. And then we might go to graduate school or work somewhere else different from that place we went to college. And we leave behind the social support network that we had before. Whereas hunter gatherers, they often live and grow up and come of age with the same people that they were born with. And the next idea is sharing. Sharing is a social expectation among hunter gatherers. And not only does sharing your food or giving something to another person bring us genuine happiness and reinforce our social support network, but I've also seen in my uh, research on fire and somalescence or relaxation that we do more than just share things. We share thoughts and ideas with each other. And part of that comes from sitting around basically a campfire. And fire has had a huge uh, impact on human evolution because we sit around fire in kind of a semi-circular fashion, we do it at night, and we tend to share stories. And this sounds a lot like the way that we watch television. Only when we watch television, we're being fed a story <coughs> through a screen, either a phone or a TV. And so we're not reinforcing those social bonds like we have been for hundreds of thousands of years of controlling fire. And so we're missing out when we disconnect from each other and we connect to our phones. So I would encourage you to put down your phone next time you're talking with your friends and connect and share. The next big topic I want to talk to you about is eating like a hunter-gatherer. And I'm not going to spend this time belaboring the paleo diet to you guys, though this is where the term comes from. This is the paleolithic period where we were foraging for food. Um, but there are some things that the modern paleo diet that we talk about every day, um, at least for me doing CrossFit, we talk about the paleo diet all the time, <laughs> is that there are a couple elements we can incorporate. One thing is variety and seasonality. Research has shown that the gut microbiome of hunter-gatherers is remarkably more diverse than ours, and it changes by the season. Some hunter-gatherers will uh, eat over 600 different species of plants and animals in their lifetime. And now compare this to the diversity that we get in our diet. It's very different. And we also don't eat seasonal fruits and vegetables, and that's what our bodies are made for. They're made um, for our gut to be able to digest foods that are available in the season of the place that we live. So if you're curious about what's being grown this season, go to your local farmer's market. The next thing is, is that if we adopt this diet of hunter-gatherers, we'll actually prevent disease. Fun fact, hunter-gatherers, many of them only ate around 10% of their diet being meat, which is very different from what we eat today, from many of our plates consist of. In addition, we see what's called an epidemiological transition here by George R. Melagus, who wrote a fantastic paper on this, and this is where we see a transition in the disease patterns between hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists. We simply do not see chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, and heart disease in hunter-gatherers, despite them living almost, if not as long, as we do. And this is because of their diet and their mobile lifestyle. And lastly, we should eat locally. And not just because it's more sustainable, but also when you eat, say, local honey, you're actually introducing local allergens, little bits of pollen, into your system, and your body is that much more well-adapted to your environment. 
So next we want to reconnect with nature. How many of us know the phase of the moon or what time the sun rises and sun sets? This is a way of life for many people on Earth still today, and certainly for 200,000 years of hunting and gathering. And this is because our bodies are made for this. We're made to be in tune with the sunrise and sunset. Hunter-gatherers usually go to bed right after, a couple hours after the sun goes down and wake right around the sunrise. And we even see that they sleep an hour more in winter. So we're made for the hibernation period as well. Um, and this starkly contrasts our idea of linear time nowadays. We block out our schedule often by the hour, and we have a to-do list for the day. So next time you go outside, I challenge you to be present. Be present outside. Next time you walk to class, get off your phone, disconnect from your phone, and connect with what's going on around you. The next topic I want to talk to you about is intentionality. And this is something that's going to become a bigger part of our life in the future, because we have to be intentional about being outside. As college students, we spend quite a bit of time outside walking to and from class. If you've ever walked from Big Good Hall or Ten Hall all the way to North Lawn, you know what I'm talking about. And when we're adults, most adults, the only time they get outside is walking from their house to their car, into work, and back again. So going forward, we have to be much more intentional with the time we spend outside, because there is no indoors for hunter-gatherers. And lastly, we can reduce our waste. Hunter-gatherers didn't really have waste because whatever they put back into the earth, the earth kind of recycled for them. It was all biological material. Whereas today, we contribute to some of the biggest culprits like re or disposable utensils and straws, which end up in our oceans and environments. So we can reduce our waste, we can recycle, and we can compost too. So if you have any leftover vegetable scraps, eggshells, or coffee grounds, you can contribute to a compost pile at your local community garden and it'll go right back into the soil and it's better for producing food as well. So you're contributing to a better earth for all of us. And some bigger ideas that have more implications for how we look at society are these ideas of egalitarianism and peace. Hunter-gatherers were very equal and they were very peaceful. They didn't have social class. Everyone had the same job get food, and protect each other. And we don't see social class emerge until agriculture, and this is because people specialize. We have farmers, we have a military, and we have a ruling class. And this is where the concept of power shifts. In uh, hunter-gatherer societies, we only have achieved power. Achieved power is power that you achieve by skill. So for example, the leader of a group of hunter-gatherers might be the most skilled hunter, or whatever skill is most valued in that society. In agriculturalist societies, with, these, with this social stratification, we see that some people are given ascribed power. This is power given by birth, either by your family, religion, social class, whatever it may be, according to the values of that society. And lastly, hunter-gatherers almost never went to war. They didn't need to because they didn't perceive territory as being theirs. If they ran into another tribe in lands that they were occupying, they would just move to another area to hunt or gather, and there wasn't a problem. But with agriculture, we can't just pick up and move a field of crops. <laughs> we need to protect the lands. We need to, grow, we need to get more and more land to provide food for the city with which we serve. And so I want to challenge your idea that humans are naturally seeking conquest and seeking to dominate other people. And I want to challenge your idea that humans are naturally hierarchical and that we form unequal societies. Because I think that's what we learn nowadays. And I want to challenge your idea of what progress means. Have we made so much progress from these so-called primitive or less developed people than we are if they're so happy and healthy with so much less than what we have? So have we made progress? What do you guys think? Thank you guys for coming to my TED Talk. If you have any questions, go ahead.